Hello, today we're going to discuss the uses of green fluorescent protein, GFP. GFP has been in existence for more than 160 million years in the waters of the northwestern Pacific in a species of jellyfish, Aquora victoria. This jellyfish contains a bioluminescent protein that produces a blue light. While the purpose of the protein in the jellyfish remains unknown, it has become one of the most valuable tools in biological research. It is instrumental for analysis of molecular processes in vitro, particularly for studying gene expression as a reporter gene, protein localization, protein to protein interactions, in examining biocides, tracking cancer cells, and in fluorescent microscopy. We will discuss some of these further today. But now, let's go back to the beginning and take a look at the history and development of GFP. As you can see from this timeline, it is a relatively new concept. We start in 1955, where the jellyfish's bioluminescence is first described. It wasn't until 1962 that Dr. Shimomura identified that the active fluorescent component was a protein and named it the green protein. Further work and investigation continued on GFP, with the late 1990s seeing GFP as a revolutionary tool for all cell biology. And in 2008, Dr. Shimomura and two of his colleagues were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in Chemistry for the discovery and development of GFP. By 2011, GFP was known as a living laser, giving scientists the ability to see the inner workings of cells. So how does it work? The structure of GFP is like any other protein. It has multiple levels of structure. The primary structure is composed of 238 amino acids. It is a beta barrel structure consisting of 11 beta strands with an alpha helix inside and a short helical segments on the ends of the cylinder. The chain of amino acids are the only part of the protein that are synthesized. The chain is folded into the right shape forming the necessary bonds in order to hold the structure rigid. In the case of GFP, this folding brings the amino acids for the chromoform close enough together to enable it to react in a way as to produce the actual chromophore. The diagram below shows how the amino acids form the structure needed for the molecule to fluoride. The amino acids serine, tyrosine and glycine are entwined deep in the protein chain folds. They interact with each other in the presence of oxygen to form a fluorescent chromophore. The protein bonds with calcium to admit, emit the blue light and the blue light is then absorbed by the GFP, converting the blue light to green. GFP doesn't require any external enzymes for this reaction. This function has made GFP such an instrumental tool in cell biology. It can be inserted into almost any organism and it lights up like a Christmas tree. And as we said before, the inner workings of all the cells can be examined without any harm to any cells. Hi, my name is Jessica and I will be talking about advantages and limitations of the green fluorescent protein technique. The advantages I will be discussing include the ability of GFP to act without cofactors, the ability to be used in vivo, the stability of the protein, the small size of the protein and development of different colours. As with most things, there are limitations with using GFP. The limitations I will be discussing include GFP requiring oxygen, the use of GFP on very small proteins, 
ability to detect the fluorescent light, and length of time for reporting. GFP is able to act without cofactors or exogenous substrates. The GFP chromophore has the ability to spontaneously modify its serine 65, tyrosine 66, glycine 67 sequence to become fluorescent and only requires oxygen for an oxidation step. Other monitoring methods such as firefly luciferase and bacterial luciferase require exogenous substrates or cofactors and this limits their suitability for use in living tissue. As the GFP doesn't require cofactors, it is able to be fused to proteins to analyse their geography, movement and chemistry within living cells. The ability of GFP to function in vivo has meant that biologists are able to watch the function of the protein being reported on in real time. The types of applications of GFP include use as markers to track proteins, probes to look at protein-protein interactions, and biosensors for biological events. Previously, the function could only be derived from non-living tissue and provided a snapshot in time. Biologists would have to get many samples and try to derive the function of the protein from these snapshots. The stability of GFP is due to its structure. GFP structure is a beta barrel protein consisting of 11 beta sheets and an alpha helix, as shown in this image. The chromophore is located in the centre of the barrel, attached to the alpha helix, which is capped by proteins at both ends. This shape offers the chromophore great protection from external factors, such as heat, chemical denaturates and extreme pH. GFP is resistant to denaturation within a pH range of 4 to 12, but even when denaturation occurs outside of this range, the restoration of the pH will allow the protein to return to its shape and its function will not be lost. The relatively small size of the GFP molecule consisting of only 238 amino acid residues, allows it to fuse to most target proteins without compromising their function. The size assists GFP to move throughout the cell without obstructing the usual processes within the cytoplasm. Since the discovery of GFP, it has been adapted to other colours. Mutant colours of yellow, cyan, blue and a brighter green fluorescent protein have been developed. Colours across the red spectrum have also been discovered from other marine organisms. Multiple colours allow for the fusion of multiple protein types simultaneously in the same cell, further highlighting how proteins interact with each other. I will now talk about the limitations of GFP. Firstly, GFP requires oxygen for the oxidative step required to make it fluorescent. This means the GFP will not fluoresce and be ineffective in reporting on proteins that exist in an environment without molecular oxygen present. Secondly, even though GFP is relatively small with only 238 amino acid residues, Proteins close to this size or smaller would likely have their function altered by the fused GFP, limiting its effectiveness on reporting in these molecules. Next, imaging machinery has lacked the ability to detect the fluorescent light signals throughout the human body, especially in tissue that is located deep within the body. The final limitation I will talk about is length of time for reporting. GFP will undergo photobleaching in time after it has been excited, thereby losing the fluorescence. This limits the use of GFP for reporting proteins whose functions take long periods of time. 
Although limitations exist for GFP, other fluorescent molecules have already been adapted and technology is advancing to overcome some of these limitations, making the future of fluorescent microscopy very bright indeed. There are a wide variety of applications for green fluorescent proteins. March, Rayo and Bentley state that its main use continues to be its function as a reported gene. On the next slide, I will quickly go through what a reported gene is and then look a bit more closely into GFP's use in cancer research. Another area in which GFP has played a major role is that of monitoring bioprocesses. For example, GFP was used to optimize the production of proinsulin. GFP can also be used to visualize whole organisms. Examples for this are the visualization of whole microbes to follow their growth, the monitoring of organisms and their dispersion in saliva, food or soil, as well as the spread of bacteria in groundwater. March, Rayo and Bentley point out that while GFP can be used to highlight activity, it can also act as a transcriptional probe. GFP is currently used to monitor pH, oxygen, temperature and nutrient values to indicate stress levels of environmental conditions. These are just a few examples of the many applications of GFP. Now let's look into what a reported gene is. The Oxford Dictionary of Genetics states that a reported gene is a gene that 1. can generate a product which is easy to visualize and 2. can respond to a regulatory signal meant for a second gene. This means that a reported gene allows us to record the activity of another gene, the gene of interest, when it is expressed. Leninger explained that the process for this is to create highly specialized cDNA libraries to which the GFP can then be attached in a vector. Here is such a vector, with the promoter at the start, the gene of interest from the cDNA library in yellow, and of course attached is the GFP in green. The vector is transferred into the host cell where the gene of interest is being transcribed into messenger RNA before this is translated into a polypeptide and folded into a hopefully fully functioning protein. As the GFP remains attached, the expressed gene can easily be seen under the microscope in UV light as it fluoresces bright green. GFP's application as a reported gene was extensively used in cancer research to observe cancer cells in vivo. A study by Hoffman described a variety of cancer types that could successfully be traced in live mice through the use of contrasting green and red fluorescent proteins. Examples are lung, mammary, prostate, intravascular and colon cancer cells. Through color coding, cancer cells could be distinguished from host cells or so-called stroma cells. This was also useful to study the cell's development and movement in live organism, as well as to track individual biomolecules. To achieve the above, host cells were labeled and therefore expressed with red fluorescent protein or RFP. GFP marked cancer cells were then implanted into the specimen and could be tracked in real time. The first of these experiments included the injection of GFP marked cancer cells into the blood vessel of the tail of a mouse. Changes could be observed to the blood vessel itself, but also to internal organs of the rodent caused by the growth of tumors. Here is an example from the article by Hoffman showing the use of contrasting healthy and cancer cells with the two different fluorescent proteins. As you can see, the stroma cells of the intestinal tract of the mouse are expressed in red, while the cancer cells fluoresce green. With the help of the fluorescent proteins, the tumor could be successfully removed. GFP and RFP can not only be used to differentiate cancer and host cells, they can also illuminate the stages a cancer cell and tumor go through in vivo. Here is a row of pictures that reveal the stages of mitosis of a cancer cell. Highlighted in red is the cytoplasm and in green the nucleus. Starting in the top left and moving across, you can see a singular cell that step by step duplicates its genetic material before it divides forming a new cancer cell. Another example of the use of GFP in cancer research is the following. Here researchers have captured a macrophage marked with GFP interacting with a cancer cell marked with RFP. As you can see in picture A, the macrophage approaches the cancer cell then starts to engulf it in picture B and has fully engulfed the cancer cell in picture C. In the last picture, we can see that the RFP marked cancer cell has been digested by the macrophage, all thanks to the use of fluorescent proteins. GFP already has many applications, but there are more possibilities for its use in the future. Hoffman stated that GFP appeared to be harmless to the animals in his cancer research article. 
As the imaging technique is non-invasive, it might be possible to apply this technique more widespread in the future. The research group around Codium proposed the use of GFP to visualize cytoskeleton on board the International Space Station, with the hope to highlight the influence of microgravity on cell structure, metabolism and processes in animal, plant and bacteria cells. The application of GFP was suggested due to its reported gene function and ease of use compared with other techniques. Luca and Luca suggest that in order to use GFP in greater tissue depth, it would need to be combined with so-called NRRF probes or dyes. NRRF stands for near infrared fluorescence. Currently, some of these dyes are too toxic to be used in vivo, but once improved, could be applied in fluorescent imaging in clinical settings. Potentially, a GFP probe or dye combination could become a useful instrument for tracking and visualizing disease location, development, and severity in patients. These are the references we've used and thank you for listening.